If you're watching this video, it's because A, you think it looks interesting, B, you actually want to learn square one, or C, you're me and you've forgotten for the third time how to solve a square one and have decided to watch your own tutorial to remind yourself. Whatever the case, I admire your love for learning, which is why I think this video sponsor will be so perfect for you. More about Skillshare later. A quick disclaimer before we begin, this tutorial will make a lot more sense if you know how to solve a three by three. It's not absolutely required, but it really will help. Believe it or not, solving the square one can be broken down into three steps. Step one, to convert the square one from this crazy shape into a cube. This step is actually called cube shape. Step two, to orient the top and bottom layers so that it ends up looking something like this. And finally, step three, as you may have guessed, to permute the top and bottom layers, resulting in a solved square one. It's that easy. <laughs> Oh, I wish it was that easy. Although in reality, it's more accurate to say that it's probably a five-step process since the orienting and permuting stages are done as a two-step process with corners first and then edges next. Probably similar to when you first learned how to solve a three by three. You probably did the OLL stage in two steps and then the PLL stage in two steps as well. In fact, those of you who know how to solve a three by three might be wondering, hey, how about the cross uh, in the F2L stage? Good question. But if you look at a square one, you'll see that cross and F2L isn't really relevant here because it's really just a top and bottom layer that can be scrambled. This middle layer, also known as the equator, essentially can't be scrambled. The only other way this middle layer can be is like this. And even so, as you just saw, this can be solved really, really easily. So if you want to think about it in three by three terms, solving these two stages is a little bit similar to solving a three by three if it looked like this. So this middle equator layer is totally solved and you essentially have to do um, OLL, on one side and then OL on the other side and then PLL and PLL. The unique thing with the square one is that you learn algorithms that actually solve OLL on both sides at the same time and PLL on both sides at the same time. I know, scary, but also really, really cool. Oh, by the way, for a three by three, do you know how we call these the corners and then these the edges? It's exactly the same thing for a square one, except corners are twice the size of an edge, but it's the same thing. Corner, edge, corner, edge, corner. Okay, with the three steps outlined, there is nothing stopping us now. Let's get into it, my friends. Starting with cube shape. Oh, cube shape. The bane of my existence. There are a total of 65 different cube shapes of which the cube is only one. And yet that is the goal. For most beginners, this alone puts them off to square one. I mean, you twist it and turn it and it just, <laughs> Sometimes you don't even seem to be able to turn it. There are websites that give you algorithms for all 65 cases, but of course there needs to be an easier way. And I'm here to tell you that this sort of is. Let's start by working backwards from what the cube needs to end up looking like. For starters, the way we hold the square one is always with the smaller part of the equator on the left side. So it always ends up turning this way, not this way. You might have noticed from that, that the very last step in solving cube shape is from this shape, which we call kite, kite. This is the only possible shape that will lead you to a cube. And so the question really becomes, how do I get that into this? Well, let's reverse engineer it a little bit more. Check out what happens when I turn the top and bottom layers of kite kite exactly 90 degrees. In other words, a U and a D move, and then do another slash. That's what we call like an R2, a slash. I end up with this shape, which is called a barrel and another barrel on the bottom. Barrel barrel is good because it can easily turn into kite kite. <laughs> I know, stay with me. Barrel barrel also conveniently can easily turn into this shape, which we call scallop and another scallop. Scallop scallop, if you orient the layers aligned with each other, that is all the edges on the same side, can slice to become barrel barrel and barrel barrel if you orient it so it's at 90 degrees to each other, so it's sort of facing this way, and then over here it's facing this way, so between the edges and between the corners, turns into kite kite, and kite kite, when you orient it so that it's aligned, will turn into cube shape. Why is that good to know? Well, it's because the easiest, although long-winded way, is to get it into that scallop scallop shape, which will then only be three slices away from cube shape. And the way I think about it is that I wanna group as many of these little edges together as possible and try and keep them in even groups. So you'll be doing a lot of trial and error at the start. Uh, I've got like one, one, three, three, no even groups at all, which isn't ideal, but I can see from experience that if I turn it like this and align it this way, I can bring the ones from there up to here 
and I now have groups of two. Let me show you what happens if I continue with this. So I'm gonna pair these two edges with that. See, whenever you slice it, the ones at the front will just join the ones back there. So I've got one scallop now, and I've got a shield. That's the name of this shape. They all have crazy names. And I can turn this into a scallop, basically move these two edges next to these two edges like this. Check this out. Gonna move these edges over to this side so that when I slice it doesn't affect them at all. Gonna move these two up the top and then I'm gonna align these two edges now there. So when then these two come back down, ta-da! And then if you remember from before, scallop, scallop, align, barrel, barrel at 90 degrees and then kite, kite. A line. Cube shape. Okay, if you're me, there's no way on earth that that actually made it clear for you. And that's totally fine. Let me give you a couple more examples. Okay, let's try this one. A shield square, which is a really hard one because square is like all these individual edges. We're just gonna start by grouping as many edges as we can together. So that's one there. And let's see, I can probably make another one. This guy, join that guy. So now at least I've got an even number there, two. I've got two there as well, which is really, really nice. Hmm, if I did this, I would get four, but then I'd sort of break a whole other bunch up. What if I did this and then join the two with the three over there? So it looks pretty good. So I've now got that going on and I've got my two down there. There's no way that I can join the two onto the five because the five just doesn't line up um, either way. I'm, I have to break one off whichever way that I do it. And here's a little trick. It's actually better to break the five this way because by separating the two ones like that, here's a little trick. I can then now align all eight together like this. See the line of ones over here joins with this six really, really nicely if you join like it like uh, edge to edge. Um, and you get this shape, which I just call the Millennium Falcon because I mean, what else it is? And the Millennium Falcon, apart from being very pretty, it also produces a star on the other side, just all the corners. Check this out, Millennium Falcon right down the middle Scallop, scallop, my friend. It is so great. So that's another way to think about it. You wanna try and get all of the edges together into this Millennium Falcon shape. And then you've got scallop, scallop. Barrel, barrel, kite, kite, cute. Now you are 100% gonna be running into issues. And you might get something like this, which is super annoying because it's like, whatever you do, you just can't get this one little edge to join with the other seven. Well, I've got two solutions for you. One is this video by Derpy Cuba where he literally goes through this case. And the second is to see if you can get that line of edges, that one one that's sort of opposite like I showed you from before. This is how I think about it. I take this out, which is like an L, and then I put the L back into the group but displace two. And if you look carefully, you can see what I did there. I've now isolated a line. Why do we like this line, uh, these sort of like opposite edges so much? Because if I pair this two up with um, the group again, I now have my row of six and this separated uh, line, and then Millennium Falcon. Hooray! Feel free to go back through that again uh, if I went too fast, but that's the way that I think about it. All I really can say for cube shape is good luck. Sort of gets better with time, I guess, but it's still a pain. Let's just call it for what it is. It is a pain in the butt. When I was trying to master the square one, what kept me going was a love for learning. And that is why this video sponsor is so perfect. Skillshare is an online learning community where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. They offer classes on almost anything you can think of, even on how to solve cubes, which includes you guessed it, the square one. Byron Irwin's class is clear and systematic and will help you take your square one journey further. And that's just one example of the thousands of inspiring classes available. For curious people like yourselves, Skillshare also has topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and much more. There are no ads, meaning you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. For less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, consider Skillshare to launch your 2021 learning journey. In fact, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership, so be sure to check it out. All right, back to the square one. Our next step is to get the square one from this to this, so orienting the top and bottom bottom layers. Not worrying yet about the sides, we'll fix that in the final step. You might be wondering, hang on, any turn that I make to the square one is gonna get it out of cube shape. That's true, but here's a little trick. If you misalign the top layer by one, and then do a slice, uh, 
Right? I know you might be thinking that this is no longer cube shape because the equator now has a flip. But remember, this is pretty much still solved. Don't worry about the equator at all during the solve. We'll fix that right at the very end. This is still considered being in cube shape. Note that the same thing can happen if you misalign the bottom layer by one and do a slice you still retain cube shape. Also, obviously all the algorithms we'll be going through will restore cube shape after it's done correctly. Okay, step two, or what I'm gonna call 2A, which is corner orientation. We wanna get all the yellow corners at the top and the white corners down the bottom. This can be done to me completely intuitively. All you have to make sure is that one of the layers is misaligned whenever you do a turn so that it retains cube shape. So check this out misalign and turn. And I've already got three quarters of all of my corners up the top. I really, I just need that one more that's up there. Obviously, if I bring it to the right side down there and bring it up, I'm gonna bring all those out as well. So there are a few clever things we can do here. One is that I can notice that, hey, when I bring that up, that's gonna be over there. And so if I make the top layer like this, check this out, pairs these two up with those two still there. And then if I move those two out of, out of the way, Ta-da! I've got all my corners now on the top. The other way that I can do that is if that corner was up there, then instead I can pair that with this guy there. So I just have to misalign one of the layers, remember? Pair these two, move it out of the way, and then bring that back. There we go. This is by far the easiest step. Just remember to misalign one of the layers whenever you do turn so that you retain cube shape. Next, step 2B is EO or edge orientation. And so we wanna get all of the yellow edges up the top and the white edges down the bottom. This is much harder to do intuitively and we've reached a point where you now need to learn algorithms. And for you to learn algorithms, you need to learn square one notation. It is very, very weird. Instead of R's and U's and D's, there are numbers and there are brackets and slashes everywhere. It looks so confusing. Let me break it down for you real quick. To differentiate between edges and corners, we give corners a value of two and edges a value of one. And that's because they're roughly twice the size of this guy. Actually, they're exactly twice the size of this. I almost think of it as like a clock face. In fact, if I just write numbers here real quick, you can see really easily how it's literally like a clock face. And you can also see why corners have a value of two. They sort of have like two hours in them and edges only have one. And so if you see the number one and it's referring to the top layer and it's positive, it means you need to do a clockwise rotation, similar to a cube where you've got like, you know, U and U prime, it's gonna be like positive one or negative one. And you need to move this clockwise by a value of one. So I guess one hour, so this. Ta -da. If it says three, it means move it over by three values or three hours, so like one, two, three. So that's a three, which corresponds exactly to like a U move, which makes sense if you think about it because every three hours is like 90 degrees. And if you see a six, it basically means do a U2. One way I think about it is that I sort of look at like where the square one cuts over here. And I think about how many of like um, these chunks are passing this, so like one, three, now, in case you're wondering, why would you do that? Because edges and corners are always next to each other. Well, they aren't always next to each other, you might remember. Because if you've got this, for example, okay, I'm sort of regretting putting those numbers now. You can't say like, oh, do a U or a U prime because it's like, what's a U prime? Like a U prime would be this, but like you can't turn that, right? You can either turn this by like a negative two or a negative four or a negative six <laughs> because of all these corners that are on the side. So real quick, every time you see a slash, it means do one of these moves or an R2. Whatever you see in brackets, the first number refers to the moves that you do to the top layer and the second number refers to what you do to the bottom layer. And so if you needed to do a U2, for example, and a slash, so nothing on the D move, you would see six comma zero, zero meaning do nothing um, to the bottom layer and then slash. If you needed to do like a U and a D prime, you would see three on the top which is a U, I know I'm using like cube notation. Uh, D prime, what's D prime? That would be a uh, negative three on the bottom, which you actually can't do over here because that's like two and two. So negative four maybe and slash. If you feel like I'm losing you, hang in there, buddy, hang in there. Just give it a go and you'll see it's not actually as terrible as it sounds. After a while, as you know, it becomes muscle memory and you're not really thinking in terms of numbers anymore. You're just like, oh yeah, this is the move. Just like how a T perm is a T perm and it's not like, are you R prime, U prime, um, whatever it is. Okay, so here's our first algorithm that we're gonna learn. It's a bit of a lengthy one, uh, but it's a goodie uh, and it's gonna swap this guy over here with 
this guy over here. So this is how you need to hold it. The one that you want to go to the top is going to be in front on the bottom layer. And the one you want to go below is going to be in the back on the top layer. By the way, all of these algorithms come from a PDF by Andy Cleese. Link in the description below. I'm mostly using his algorithms plus a bunch of stuff which I learned from Daniel Connor, AKA Derby Huber. Here we go. So the first bracket says zero negative one. First number of first at the top, zero means nothing. Bottom negative one. So that is one move this way. Remember it's like a negative and so it's like a deep prime move, I guess you're thinking like anti-clockwise, zero, negative one slash, and then a negative three, zero. So negative three up the top, zero slash four, one. So four and one slash, and then it's palindromic. In other words, you sort of just reverse everything from there. You can also just remember the numbers, but I think of it as being palindromic. So I just did four, one. So I'm doing negative four and negative one now, negative four, negative one. And then I did negative three before. So now I'm going to do a positive three, which is this. And then a one at the bottom to align it again. But yeah, I'm essentially done. And there you go. I swapped that guy with that guy. So let's do the same thing now with this. So move that to the back, move that over here. We'll do the same thing. Zero, negative one, slice. Negative three, zero, slice. And then a four and one, four and one, slice. And then the reverse of all of that, negative four and one, slice, positive three, slice. And you can actually see why you'd be doing that because you need to bring yellow back up to the top. And then we're done. There are more algorithms than that. For example, this guy over here where you can swap like two and two at the same time. Feel free to learn that in your own time. But let me just get it into um, position. There's also this one where you have to swap these two with um, these two over here. Instead of doing that like single um, edge swap thing twice over here, this is also known as an M2 move. How do you do an M2? You might be wondering. Um, obviously for three by three, it's just that. That's the M2 move. This is how you do an M2 with the square one. And it's a wonderful, super easy algorithm to learn. And it's just this. Misalign by one, either the top or the bottom layer. I like to start with the top slice and then now do a one one or in this case would be negative one negative one where you move both over by one like that and slice again that's how you do an m2 it's actually a really fast move that will actually come in handy uh, with some later algorithms especially when you're getting over to like intermediate stuff ladies and gentlemen we're getting there step three despite being the last step this is actually a pretty long step but again don't give up you've come this far you can do it my friends those of you who know your three by threes will actually be able to recognize that these are proper pls for example right at the top i have headlights over here and this guy so this is a g D? Yeah, it's a GD. Yeah, GB would have the headlights over here. While at the bottom, I've got a bar over here and I've got, uh oh, this is not a recognizable PLL uh, on the bottom. And that's because I've got parity. Here's what that parity PLL looks like on a three by three. So the bar over there, but then I've got this soft light corner over here and that going on. And if you're wondering how I did that, it's because, ta da, I cheated. The parity algorithm on the four by four essentially just does this, right? And then now I've got a recognizable PLL. Ooh, left DJA, my daughter would be so proud of me. There are three ways of dealing with parodies in square one. One, the most advanced method is by solving cube shape in a way that you don't get a parody. This is called CSP. I have no idea how to do it. Maybe one day, but yeah, that's not gonna happen in this video. The second and still pretty hard way is by detecting at this very stage that you're gonna have parity, which is by seeing that you've got normal permutation on one layer and an abnormal parity one on the other layer and then doing an algo right now that fixes it. Or finally by fixing parity at the very end. Pretty much all beginners, myself included, learn to solve parity at the very end. And this is an example of what it might look like. You might be thinking, uh, this is way easier to recognize as parity compared to this. So why wouldn't you just do it then as opposed to now? Well, because the algorithm required to fix this parity is stupidly long. There are 13 slashes in this algorithm, which means like 13 sets of brackets and arguably 26 moves to memorize. It is disgusting. Whereas this guy only requires a seven slash algorithm. It's much more optimal when it comes to like turn count, except it's harder to pick up. So which way should you do it? Well, if you're an absolute beginner, you can probably skip this little part right here and just do parity at the very end. But if you're pretty well versed with three by three and you can afford 
record a few seconds. So have a quick look around the cube at this point before you uh, permute the top and bottom layers and recognize, hey, I'm gonna get a parody. Then yeah, do a different parody alg right now and save the heartache of this like disgusting 13 move alg. I should quickly mention, by the way, that if both your top and bottom layers are both parody cases, you will not get parody at the end. It's sort of like two negatives become a positive. So yeah, normal PLL, normal PLL, no parody. Parody, parody, no parody. One normal, one parody, or the other way around. That's when you get a parody, and that's when you do this parody case. Slash, three, three, slash, one, zero, slash, four, negative two, slash, and then it's uh, the mirror of that. It's another one of those nice palindromic algorithms. So um, I just did uh, four, negative two, so now I'm gonna go negative four, and two, and then negative one, and then negative three, negative three, which you can see it's like, you know, Kite, kite. And there you go. So now if I have a quick check, both of it should be normal PLLs. And indeed, I've got the R perm up here. And on the bottom, I have got a G. Which G is that? That is a GA. Hooray. So now let's continue with the final stage, which is to permute the top and bottom layers. Let's start with CP or permuting the corners, moving all the corners in the correct positions. So that you end up getting a cube that looks something like this. It's just the edges that need to be moved around to get solved. It may please you to know that there are only three different combinations that you can really get when it comes to corners. They can either be solved, so they're all in the correct position, or you can have um, adjacent swaps, which is what I have here at the top. So I've got these two in the correct position. Um, if I move them over to the red side, it doesn't really matter. You can just see that, you know, if it's a head headlights, like, you know, both the same color, they are both in the correct position. And it's just these two adjacent ones, side by side ones you need to swap. Or you can get diagonal swaps, uh, which I have over here. You might recognize this as a V perm, if you know the three by three. And this is an example where there are no two side by side that are correct. But if I swap any two diagonal ones, those two or these two, uh, this entire layer's corners will be solved. And so arguably, you could actually learn to solve this step uh, with just two algorithms, one learning an adjacent swap and one learning a diagonal swap. And if you're wondering, well, hang on, if that's only the top, how do I do the bottom? There's also a sneaky mix, sneaky way of swapping the bottom and top layers, which is what Andy Klee suggests uh, in his PDF, so that you only need to learn algorithms for the top layer and then do this alg, check it out. So slice six, six, which means like a U2 and a D2. So that and that, and then slice again <laughs> and check that out. I've literally moved the bottom layer to the top layer. And then I just do like the same algorithm again to the top. And then I can just like bring it back down. But very strangely, the CP algorithms for individual layers, in my opinion, are a lot more complex than the ones that do both at the same time. So which way should you learn it? It's up to you. I'm gonna present them all to you here. You pick and choose which ones make most sense to you. So there are five combinations in total when it comes to CP for the top and bottom layer. Just to remind you again, adjacent, diagonal. So the five cases are, I could have diagonal, diagonal. I could have adjacent, diagonal. I could have adjacent, adjacent. And then finally, I could have ones that are just one layer. So adjacent and nothing, and then diagonal, and nothing. Okay, so here's our first example where I have no headlights, no two corners that are the same on both top or bottom, which means that this is gonna be diagonal, diagonal. And I start with this one because it's the nicest one of all. All of the CP algorithms, by the way, can all be expressed in like three by three terminology because they don't have any like one, two, four, five moves. It's always three or negative three. In other words, you can actually think of the whole thing as being like U, U prime, uh, D, D prime moves. And I'll be using them so somewhat interchangeably here, but maybe more importantly, I'm actually gonna tell you how I learned to memorize these things. So I'm starting with Diag Diag because it is the easiest one of all and is this, check it out. That's it. So it's literally this slash, move both layers in the same direction. Well, it's actually like counterclockwise and clockwise for the bottom, but you know, you know what I mean by same direction, it's like one hand can do it. Yeah, so like 90 degrees, slash, reverse that, slash again. That's it. Note that this will work, by the way, if my right hand had done it as well. So if it was like that way, and then back that way, exactly the same. Fun fact, if you do this to a solved uh, square one, you will actually get ta -da, a double end perm and a very confused clock. Case number two, adjacent diag. So that's this one over here. I've got a diagonal on the top and I've got adjacent on the bottom. So this is the way that I think about it. I put my headlights, 
on the left. So headlights, like those are the two that are uh, correct. And then the layer, that's a diagonal. That's the one that moves. Okay, so this is how I think about it. Slice and then turn that guy actually either way. Slice, turn it back. Slice, turn that guy again. Slice, turn it back. Done. This one's a really easy one to remember because had it been the opposite where it was um, adjacent on top and diagonal below, then the bottom layer is the one that will be moving like left, right, left, right. So slice and then you can actually go either way, whether it's like D prime or D. In this case, I'm just going to go D, slice back, D prime, slice, D, slice, D prime and done. Ooh, let me actually quickly say for those of you experienced cubers that you might be wondering whether this case is diagonal or adjacent because it's parity. Uh, whenever you see headlights, just treat it as if it is um, adjacent. Final case is um, adjacent adjacent. So for this one, um, the soft ones go to the back. And so adjacent adjacent goes to the very back. And this is how I think about it. We start with the slice again, and we're gonna U prime on top, slice, and then U on top while now the bottom does uh, like sort of that move that the top did and then slice now the bottom and then done. Uh, let me reverse that real quick. The way I actually think about this is almost like a bit of a round robin. You know the song Frere Jacques where like where the first person starts singing Frere Jacques, Frere Jacques, Dormez vous, Dormez. But when they hear Dormez vous, the, the next person starts with Frere Jacques. Frere. So like the second person's always like one step behind. That's exactly how I think of this as well. So you might notice that in between all the slashes for this algorithm, the top layer does this and then back again. And so does the bottom layer. It does this and then back again, but like delayed by one. So see if you can spot what I mean. So slash, top, slash. And then now when the top layer is doing this, the bottom layer starts and does that. And slash, and now the bottom layer just needs to finish because the top has already finished. It's like a two-step Frere Jacques song. So if that didn't make sense to you, but that was how I learned it. It's another really nice short algorithm. And now you'll see why the last two CP algorithms are so annoying when you just need to fix like adjacent or diagonal in one layer. So this is a case where the bottom is solved and I've got adjacent at the top. So this is how you do it. You put the solved corners at the back. Uh, if you're wondering, by the way, hey, where are the headlights? Um, the headlights are still there. The center edge just happens to be the same color, but it's still, you know, both uh, solved corners um, at the back. And then we do this slash both in the same direction. Uh, I normally just go right hand first slash and then this top layer that needs fixing does one of does like uh, there again and then back. So there slash back and then this bottom one does back slash and then that's my kite kite this. If that didn't make sense to you, just use those numbers in the algorithm up there. This is just how I memorized it. Actually, another reason why I explained it that way is because it's now a lot easier to apply it if it was the bottom instead of the top. And so if the top um, corners are all correct, but it's the bottom uh, that needs fixing. And as you can see, it's just adjacent. We put that at the bottom. So the same thing, we start with both, but this time it's the bottom one uh, that continues and then goes back, top goes back, bottom goes back. And so you can see you can easily now apply to the bottom layer. And finally, for the most annoying case of all, when it's a diagonal um, corner swap on one of the sides and the bottom one is solved. Just like all of the other CP algs, by the way, it always starts with a slash. I should have said that earlier. They all start with a slash. And then top and bottom layer in opposite directions. And then whichever side it is that requires like the diagonal swap, after the slash, you do one more in that direction, just itself. And then you repeat, slash, both in opposite, just that side both in opposite and Bob's your uncle. Let's do the diagonal swap again, but this time for the bottom layer. So starting with a slash, opposite directions, which by the way means you could actually go like um, this direction if you wanted, slash, and then just the side that needs the fixing. One more that way, uh, this, one more on its own, this, and done. And that, ladies and gents, means we're onto our final stage, EP edge permutation. Um, if you see this, you'd be so happy. Well, you'd probably be happiest if you get a complete skip, which is quite rare because you need you know, a skip on both layers. But if you see this, you'd be so happy because despite the millions of different variations you can get here, pretty much all of them can be solved with what we call the adjacent adjacent algorithm. Uh, so we're doing edges now, not corners, which basically turns the cube into this. And it's a move that looks like that. It's fast, really easy to do, and for beginners, it's like the magical algorithm that will solve everything. The algorithm goes one zero, so just a one up the top, slash, 
zero three, so nothing up the top, but a three down the bottom, which is a D slash negative one, negative one, which is just that little move like that, you know, when you just do that slash one, negative two, so one up the top, two in the bottom slash and a little negative one to fix the top, but yeah, once again, one, zero, zero, three, one, 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 negative two. If there was ever an alg to drill, this would be it. Because you might have to do it like, you know, upwards of three or four times to solve the top layer. But if you can do it quickly, it takes like a few seconds. It's actually pretty quick. So here's an example of an EP case that you might get and you might be going, what even is this? Now let's take a slow look. As you can see on the top, that's a U perm. And at the bottom, we have a Z perm, really nice. But how are you gonna solve it with that adjacent adjacent algorithm? Well, remember that this adjacent adjacent algorithm always swaps these two and these two. In other words, your goal is to reduce this until it finally ends up looking like that. How can we do that? Well, here's how. If I do that edge adjacent adjacent alg right now, holding it like this, I'm gonna swap these top two around, which will solve this. This will be completely orange. And then this will be uh, green, red, green, red, green, red, which is perfect because I just want like, you know, that to be able to do one final one of this to fix it. But if I look at the bottom, I'm gonna swap these two around, which is not what I want. But notice that if I just do that, now if I do the adjacent adjacent alc, I'm gonna solve these two sides. This will be completely orange and completely blue. And then this will be solved. And I'm just gonna have one adjacent left and another adjacent left. So despite how complicated this looks, this whole thing can be solved with just two adjacent adjacent algs. I know, it's magical. So let's do it once here. And as predicted, I completely solved this side. And if I just rotate the bottom layer, Make sure that it's like, you know, to the right on the top and a bit to the left on the bottom and do it one more time. My friends. Oh, wait. Sorry. My friends. That's it. It's that easy. No, I refuse to believe it could be that easy. Fine. Here's another case. So uh, this is probably more commonly seen. So I've got a double U perm. So right now, if I do the adjacent adjacent alc, I'm going to swap these two and these two. And if you think about it, that's the opposite of what I want because it means green will be solved. And then now these two edges will be like opposite each other. And the same thing over here, orange will be solved and these will be opposite, which means I can't do another one of these. But if I hold it like this, and I think like this, yeah, this will work because now this will be fully red and then this would just be adjacent and this will be fully blue and this will be adjacent. So if I do the adjacent adjacent out here, Ta -da! I'm now just one move away from solving it. Those of you who know your square one algorithms and said, hey, have had you gotten that uh, case which you said was so problematic? So, you know, this one where it's like opposite. Actually, this is super easy to solve as well. So, you know, you can do this with two adjacent adjacent algorithms, but you can also do it with one special M2 with just one of these U2s in the middle. So M2, remember, was this, right? Well, guess what? If you do that and then you do a U2, and you do an M2 again, magic. And I would happily end the video here if not for two final things. One is that it's possible to finish the cube and it ends up looking like this. This is just when the equator is flipped and it's really, really easy to fix. It's just this slash U2 or a six or whatever, slash again, again U2 or a six slash, and that's it. And then finally, the dreaded, <laughs> Although quite interesting looking algorithm, the edge parity. If you do all those adjacent adjacent algs and you find that you just cannot solve the whole thing because it ends up looking like this, or it might be like this is red, orange, red, and that's orange, red, orange, and everything else in the whole cube is solved, you have got parity and you will need to learn this 13 slash algorithm. Apart from starting from the beginning again or going back several steps, there is no way around it. You can just print it out or like tattoo it on your arm or something. I spent days and days getting into my memory and maybe it was worth it. Tell you what though, knowing this parity alc makes you feel like a boss and also like a complete loser because when you practice it, it is so easy to mess it up. And then all of a sudden you have to solve cube shape again and do the entire thing. It is so, so frustrating. Try your best to learn it, but for what it's worth, let me tell you how I memorized it. So I think of it this way, slash, and then there's a whole bunch of threes. In other words, it's like 90 degree moves, right? So it's like U prime on the top, slash D on the bottom. So if I just my left hand, slash D prime, slash D, slash. So, so far it was sort of like uh, U prime, uh, D, D prime, D, right? So slash U prime, D, T prime, D. 
And after every move, it's like it's like a slash. And then come a bunch of twos. Uh, in other words, like just these corners, because that's a value of two. So two up the top, two on the bottom. Oops, that's three, two. Negative two up the top. And then one random four, which is all of these up the top, which then gives you that nice characteristic group of three edges down the bottom. And you move it so that you get to the end of all of those. Slash, and then go back to where you were before slash and you're very very close to the end this is the only move where both layers uh, go at the same time and it's negative one four so negative one and four down the bottom so one two three four slash and you can see from here how you finish done oh and a deep at the end all together now slash u prime d d prime d and then lots of twos, two, two, negative two, four, negative two, two, negative one and four, my D prime and my D. Oh, and if you get the adjacent parity at the bottom, then just do the algorithm where you swap the bottom and top layers, slice six, six, slice, and then, and then do the parity algorithm here, fix that, and then bring it back down again. Slice, six, slice, Oh, and then fix that equator. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you solve a square one. I hope that helped. And Ting Man, if you're the one who's watching this in the future because you've forgotten it again, uh, it is time that you've just memorized it once and for all. Huge thank you again to Andy Cleese for the algorithm and to Derby Cuba for your thoughts and also for uh, watching this entire video just to make sure that it was fine. This was a challenge, but learning stuff I hope you can see is so much fun. So don't forget again to check out Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Subscribe if this was helpful and happy square one -ing. Bye.